Okay, the bell has tolled. So, uh, um, welcome to a very interesting special presentation that we're having today in uh, Mr. Jefferson's Rotunda. Um, we'll be hearing from Jack and Drucker, who I got to know in a very modern way by the Twitter. How many of you use the Twitter? I know a lot of you use the Twitter. So, uh, um, Jack, of course, is, a, is an inventor, uh, very young one. He's uh, just still about a year to go in high school, and uh, he's already been engaged in some very big ideas and been able to inspire a lot of people. Uh, and so, I thought it would be wonderful to be up here and talk to the and others at the PBA. Uh, so, you'll be hearing from him in a minute. I wanted to say a couple of words. One thing I have to apologize for, it turns out that we've got too much light in here. We don't have a dimming mechanism on the Oculus, so. The PowerPoint is not going to work so well. Um, that's fine. Uh, what we have to say, I hope, is more important than what we have to show. So, uh, um, I just want to say a couple of introductory words. Um, try to get out of the way of this projector in case you can see a couple of words there. Um, then I'll turn the floor over to Jack. This will be pretty informal. Feel free to ask questions. I think, do you mind being interrupted? No, no, no. You don't mind being interrupted. Interrupted at any point, if you like. Um, and we'll probably have some people joining us as time goes on. Um, so, um, this is a, you can't see it, but there's this uh, Gauguin painting that uh, you're supposed to imagine this, this famous painting of his, which has an inscription at the top left, where do we come from, what are we, where are we going? And I had this long tradition at the end of every class of showing the painting and asking a sort of a riff on this question is, uh, where are you going, how will you get there, how will you know when you and, uh, and so that's sort of the overarching theme here, is how do you, how do you think about the big ideas that you would like to accomplish? How will you get to that, to that destination? And how will you know when you finally accomplish what it is that you set out to accomplish? And so um, this sort of uh, idea of pursuing big ideas is something that, of course, is familiar in the academic <coughs> um, But there are all kinds of things that get in the way along the way. And, so really, the, the purpose of the talk today is to remind people of the importance of having a big goal, um, setting something there in the distance that you can progress towards. So I guess this is a message mostly for undergraduates and I have some high school students here as well. Um, so um, some of you uh, probably attended a lecture by Randy Pausch. Um, he was a CS professor here and also at Carnegie Mellon, um, and I believe that gave his talk, I think it was 2007 or so, he gave a series of talks um, that were very, very inspiring to the broad community, and you can find them all over the internet now, particularly on YouTube and so forth. Um, one of the talks that he gave was really achieving your childhood dreams, in which he talked about the importance of setting out really big goals, things that you think you may not even be able to accomplish, and searching for ways, to search for people that will help you to accomplish those things, and learning how to uh, stay inspired, stay motivated, and uh, you know, that kind of thing. And so, um, you know, when I started uh, interacting with Jack and discussing the, um, the, the work that he was doing, it just dawned on me that there's this connection between him and Randy Pausch on so many different levels. One is, of course, the, the big thinking, the big ideas, the idea of staying inspired and so forth. But as it turns out, you'll find out that um, what ultimately took Randy Pausch's life 2007 um, is happens to be what Jack is working on a, a test to detect uh, early early tests for pancreatic cancer, um, and so it's a very interesting connection. I thought it was kind of interesting to think that Randy Pausch, in his way, was trying to inspire people even as he was dying and going around giving these famous lectures and uh, he was getting inspired by them. He was it, it helped him actually hone his message that time is important that you need to. The big picture is to stay focused on your long-term dreams and so forth. So I hope you just keep that in mind um, as we progress through this. Um, so uh, one of my favorite quotes from Randy Pausch's uh, last lecture is this, Jim. Brick walls are there for a reason. They let us prove how badly we want things. This is probably the one-line summary of his presentation in the last lecture. And I think that's such a really beautiful sentiment. Um, young people who have big dreams and big ideas tend to encounter brick walls. Some of us have, you know, uh, blisters on our forehead we're encountering these, these, these brick walls. The important thing is to keep moving forward, and um, and you'll hear a lot of things along the way. 
that may discourage you. For example, it won't work. It's too hard. It's too expensive. I know you can't see my graphics in the background here, but if you look at the top layer, trust me, it's clever. Um, okay. So there's all kinds of things. You're, you're going to hear all kinds of messages over and over and over that might be sort of dispiriting. You're not experienced, mature, credentialed, connected, old, school, serious, published, blah, blah, blah. All kinds of things that get in the way that act like brick walls that might um, discourage you from carrying on towards uh, reaching the, the goals that you have. And, uh, oh, and this is one of my favorites. I think Jack has heard this one before. If it were that easy, somebody would have done it before. I think a lot of you buy medical heard that one, a couple of different riffs on that particular theme. Um, and this is one for the students. If you haven't had MAE 2300, CE 2300, blah, 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 all these different classes, then you're just not ready to be doing this kind of work. You're not ready to be getting in the lab and you know, working on your own ideas and this kind of thing. Um, academia at its worst tends to feel like a bunch of brick walls that you can't get through. But on the other hand, the important thing to remember is that these brick walls tend to separate you from something that's worth having. That's why they're there. So um, I have a little image from the academic village that you can't see. Our brick walls, of course, are nice and pretty and curvy. Uh, in a traditional place like UVA, we love our brick walls. We've got plenty of them all over the place. Um, and those brick walls tend to make people think more about the brick walls than what's on the other side. That's just what I wanted to sort of my little pot shot at, at traditionalism. Um, and so I have a Thomas Jefferson quote here, right? Very important quote, do it. Um, okay, that isn't exactly what he said. What he actually said was something about liberty and tyranny and citizens and all this kind of stuff, and I pulled do and it out of that. Um, but here's a, here's a real Jeffersonian quote, which I think is very good. Um, I'm a great believer in luck, and I find the harder I work, the more I have of it. One of my favorite Jefferson quotes, and of course we have to quote TJ here, sitting in the, in the rotunda. Um, and uh, I just want you to sort of keep that, that idea in mind, that sometimes you have a big idea, there's all these brick walls or whatever. There may be some luck, but you'll find that a lot of times some perseverance helps you get through. Um, now, Randy Pausch, toward the end of his life, um, he, was deliver he delivered one lecture here at UVA in 2007 um, called Time Management that you can see on YouTube. It's really wonderful. And one of my favorite quotes from that particular lecture was, I've always felt every day is a gift. Now I'm wondering where to send a thank you. The question is, where will you be sending your thank you card? Who are the people that are going to help you think about your big ideas and help you, you know, realize that these are things that can actually be achieved? Um, and, uh, you know, this is somebody, uh, you can't see the, the graphics here, but that Randy was, you know, he had literally three to six months to live, but yet he was able to find so many things that were inspiring to other people and considered it his utmost mission to inspire the young people, particularly. Um, now, here we have uh, Jack, which you can't see here. You can just see a ghostly image, but you'll see him in the flesh here in a minute. Um, even at times of hardship, and quite often because of times of hardship, we find inspiration. And you'll see that, that uh, as Jack will present to you, you'll see how he sort of turned that around. He took a difficult, personally difficult situation and was able to use it to inspire him to work on something really, really interesting and revolutionary. Um, so you'll be hearing from him on how he made that progress, and I hope that some of these big quotes and questions and all this kind of stuff that I raised will be in the background. Uh, my big question to you is, what are your brick walls? What are the things that you want? What are the things you want to accomplish? And what are those? What's keeping you from doing that? Um, and uh, I really appreciate you coming to visit and hear us talk. I realize that this, uh, the PowerPoints and all this kind of stuff, that you're not going to be able to see much because there's too much light in here. Projector isn't uh, luminous enough. Um, but you can uh, reach all of us. There's Jack, is famous on Twitter. Jack and Rocky, you can reach him on Twitter as well. Um, and I'm there as Alex Zaretta, who's sitting back there as a biomedical uh, entrepreneur. When I talk about people who may be able to help you, there are a number of people here who could uh, perhaps help. We have a new nanomedicine company member, Mark Kester is here, and he's also going to be director of Nanostar. There's all kinds of people here um, who, uh, who can help and point you in the right direction and help things get started. Um, so uh, feel free to reach out to various of us, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, this is, turns out to be an inspiring event. So without further ado, let me introduce Jack Andraka. He is um, currently in his junior year of high school. No, you can stand up. <laughs> He's in his junior year of high school. I will stop talking about it. Yes. No, go ahead. I'm going to sit down. He's going now, and I'm going to take a seat. 
So um, I suppose my story really began when I was 13, and that what really happened was a close family friend who was like an uncle to me actually passed away from pancreatic cancer. And when that happened, I wanted to do a bit more research because I wasn't sure what uh, pancreatic cancer was in the the pancreas, as I was only in some grade. And as I did deeper, I found that 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late when someone has less than a 2% chance of survival. And the main cause for this is because we currently don't have a way of diagnosing the cancer. I mean, our current method is a 60-year-old technique, which is older than my dad, but also costs $800 per test and is grossly inaccurate, missing 30% of all cancers. And in order to get these tests, your doctor would have to really be ridiculously suspicious that you have the cancer. Essentially, you have to have a family history of getting this cancer. And so I thought, well, I'm um, ninth grade biology, I'm going to try and change this. I lost the other goal, however, I was going to try and achieve it. And so I did a bit more research, and I found what sites for pancreatic cancer would really have to look like in order to be effective. And the sites would have to be inexpensive, rapid, simple, sensitive, selective, and minimally invasive. And I was pretty sure I could do this, I wasn't exactly sure how. And then I went back online. They found out why we haven't updated our sensor in over six decades. And so, just as a bit of a like, seeing how technical I should make this, how many of you guys are in like biomedical engineering? All right, or have like some science music. How many of you guys know what antibody is? All right, okay, I'm to my talk now. So, when we're looking for these cancers, we're looking at your bloodstream, particularly for these variations in protein levels. And while this sounds really straightforward, it's anything but, because you have these liters and liters of blood, which is already abundant all these proteins, and you're looking for this tiny variation, this minuscule amount of protein, and so it's next to impossible. It's like trying to find a needle in a stack of nearly identical needles. However, I was unsure due to my teenage optimism, or how some people label it, complete and utter ignorance of the entire field of biology. And I went to any high school as best source of information, Google Wikipedia, I was going to do every testing quiz. And I essentially found a database of over 8,000 proteins that I found in the bloodstream when you have these cancers. And it was summer break, I had nothing else to do, so I shut my door and researched every single one of those proteins. That means the summer is really down my potential for any future social interactions, really. I mean, I mean, for some really interesting back-to-school essays, my teacher would be like, oh, what did you do this summer? And my friend was like, I went to Yellowstone, and then I was like, I researched 8,000 proteins. There's all these awkward calls after that, and it's kind of a weird person to hit. However, on the 4,000th try, I finally found one protein that could potentially work, and the name of this protein was called mesothelin. And it's just your ordinary round of milk type protein, unless, of course, you have pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer. In which case, it's found at these very high levels in your bloodstream. But the key is, is that it's found in the earliest stages of the disease, when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. So if you could theoretically detect this protein, you could detect the cancer in the earliest stage. However, we were still lacking the tool to really detect that protein. So that's what I was going to try and do. And along this long, epic journey that was me finding a new way to detect pancreatic cancer, I had one real key moment in happened a very unlikely place, high school biology class, the absolute spiteful organization. Particularly with my high school biology teacher, we didn't really get along. And one day, it escalated to the point where I was going to rebel like any self-respecting teenager would by sticking in an article on single-walled carbon nanotubes. That would show that's some real science in biology class. And so I was being, um, how many of you guys know what single-walled carbon nanotubes are? All right, so for those who don't know, it's this long, thin tube of carbon that's an atom that spans 150,000 centimeters of your hair. So they're extremely small, and they have these really amazing properties. They're kind of like the superheroes of material science. Like, they're stronger than steel and conduct electricity better than copper. Like, all these really amazing things. And so I was just sitting there reading about this article while we were learning about what are called antibodies. And an antibody is essentially a molecule that only reacts with one specific protein in this case, a cancer biomarker. And so then, I was just sitting there in class when all of a sudden it hit me. You see, you can take these single walled carbon nanotubes and you kind of just bunch them up into this large network, and then you take these antibodies and you 
fit into this network, such that you have a kind of sensor that would only react with one specific protein due to the antibody. But also, due to the amazing properties of the nanotube, it will actually change how electricity flows through it based on the amount of protein present, and thus indicate whether or not you have the cancer. And how the sensor works is kind of analogous to having a bundle of wires and you're stretching it apart. And when you stretch that bundle of wires apart, there's going to be less connections between each wire. And that means less pathways for electricity to take and thus a higher resistance. And so that's essentially what's happening with the carbon nanotubes. When this protein goes in there, it forms a larger molecule with the antibody. This kind of fissures apart all of these nanotubes from each other and causes a change in its electrical resistance which you can actually measure with just a $50 in meter from home vivo. And just as soon as I kind of had this epiphany moment, I realized I might need a lab with cancer research on my kitchen countertop on the morning of late. Me and my brother had done some crazy stuff and made high-grade explosives down there. We also cultured E. coli and cholera where we made sandwiches and even ordered uranium off a very sketchy Russian website, but that then was on the FBI watch list. However, cancer research wasn't exactly in the family budget, so I ended up emailing two hundred different professors at Johns Hopkins University and the National Institute of Health with 32 page but few of the documents outlining my procedure, how to collect my data, all of that. And I just shot out in that, I kind of cyber stalked all of those professors and would look at all the research interests until I finally found one that was interested in PCI cancer. And so I sent these out in mass and we for all these positive emails to pour into maybe the chaotic Wonder Boy space of the world. And then I come to reality hit and got 199 rejections. And I realized a lot of those professors weren't really as nice as those gluing profile pictures make them seem on the site. They were actually very mean at times. However, one actually went through my entire procedure line by line, explicitly saying why like, each step was like the worst possible mistake I could ever make. And I was like really wondering where he got this time to do it. It was like a hobby of his, like make fun of like high schoolish research proposals. However, <laughs> instead of like crocheting or something normal. However, I kept going at it until I finally got one positive email from Dr. Annabelle Maisha of John Hopkins University. And when that happened, I kind of jumped off the balls and I went into this big interview, just in sweat pants and hoodie, so I have the most professional attire. However, I go in and I'm armed with these giant stacks of papers and he packs in 29 PhDs into this room, plus him, and they just grill me on all of my procedure and I stumble out an hour later. I had to guess on so many of those questions I always get to see like they do in my SATs. However, I got through and eventually I could start in the lab and then I, as soon as I got in the lab, I realized I really sucked at doing research. I mean, I made so many mistakes. First day, it was like culture cancer studies, and I ended up sneezing my cell blast. And I was like, the, I was like, oh, cancer cells, they have like an immune system or something. They're trying to to kill off, but they should survive. No, they're like comfortable with growing up the next day. However, over the course of the next seven months, I tried to make like cellular genocide on some level because I'd like trip and break my glass, be like burn them up in the incubator, like I went to blew them up in the centrifuge and some cell media went everywhere. I thought it was totally worth it. My lab mentor at this point was like, why would I ever let this kid in my lab? However, seven months later, I ended up with one small paper sensor that costs three cents and it takes five minutes to run. And this makes it 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 42 times more sensitive than our current methods of PCI cancer detection. But also, it can so far detect the cancer with a 90% accuracy rate and can detect the cancer in the early stage, with some tests to a 100% chance of survival. And so in the next two to five years, this patent pending sensor could potentially lift the once dismal PCI cancer survival rate from 5.5% to close to 100%, and we do similar for a very